to tell the story of the Star Spangled Banner, we've got to go back to the War of 1812 that was fought between the 18 United States and Great Britain from June of 1812 to the spring of 1815. The main land fighting of the war occurred along the Canadian border in the Chesapeake Bay region. Along the Gulf of Mexico there was some fighting and extensive, extensive action also took place at sea. Ever since the United States had declared its independence, there were some problems with its relationship to Great Britain. At the end of the American Revolution in 1783, the United States had been uh, encountering these difficulties with Great Britain. And the British government had decided that it would board American ships, confiscate the crews, and force them to serve in their own British Navy because they didn't have enough skilled uh, Navy men to staff their own ships. And so they began to do that. And this cartoon from the Times illustrates that Great Britain had, became, had become a pain and a place that you can readily locate to the American citizens forcing them into duty in the, in the British Navy. The United States declared war against Great Britain. At the time she declared war, she had a total of 14 naval vessels. The country was bankrupt. On August 24th, 1814, the British Army, the Redcoats, invaded Washington and completely overran the city. They completely destroyed the buildings, the memorials in Washington, D.C. And they came to the White House where President James Madison had barely escaped with his life. The commanders of the British forces sat down at dinner, the dinner that was left on the table in the White House, and consumed the food there. And then as they left, they burned the White House to the ground, as they did all of the buildings in Washington, D.C. They ransacked the White House before they left, they stole everything that they could carry off. And then the British Army headed toward Baltimore. Over 40 ships in the British Navy and 4,000 British troops assembled to attack Fort McHenry in what was going to be the 19th century equivalent of a shock and awe campaign. Additional troops and additional naval vessels were en route from Bermuda. A young lawyer from Baltimore by the name of Francis Scott Key was asked by President James Madison to volunteer to go to the British and attempt to negotiate a prisoner exchange, one American prisoner for one British prisoner. By this time, both sides had taken many prisoners of war. It was known that the British were holding American prisoners aboard ships in the Chesapeake Bay. So with the approval of James Madison, President Madison, and with all of the official documentation that was necessary, Key set out on a two-week voyage down the bay to find the already departed British fleet. On the afternoon of September 13, 1814, Francis Scott Key found the British command ship and made a request to speak to the Admiral on behalf of the President of the United States. He discussed with, with the Admiral a pro possible 
prisoner exchange. Admiral Alexander Cochrane was impressed with Francis Scott Key. And Key, being a very persuasive man, successfully negotiated the release of prisoners. And then, as one story tells us, he was permitted to go down into the hold of the prison ship and give the news to the prisoners. What he found there was a cargo full of humanity. Men crowded together in chains, in, in unlivable conditions, in filth. Francis Scott Key said to the men, Men, I've got good news for you. Tonight, you're going home. I've negotiated your release. You're free. You'll be taken out of this boat and out of this filth and out of these chains, and you'll, you will be released back to your families. As he went back on deck to arrange for their release, the admiral said to Francis Scott Key, We have a problem. We will still honor our commitment to release prisoners, but after what happens this evening, it'll be merely academic. Francis Scott Key said, what do you mean? The admiral said, Mr. Key, tonight we've given an ultimatum to the colonies. Your people will either capitulate and lay down that color, those colors of that flag that you so cherish, or you see Fort McHenry right over there, if they refuse to surrender, we're going to wipe that fort off the face of the earth. Francis Scott Key said, how are you going to do that? The admiral said, look around the horizon. Francis Scott Key looked and he saw hundreds of tiny little dots, all representing the British war fleet. The admiral said, that's the entire British war fleet with all of the weapons and all of the gunpowder that we're going to call upon to destroy that fort. We're going to begin our offensive in a couple hours. The war is over. These men would be free anyway. Francis Scott Key said, you can't do that. That, that fort primarily is not a military fort. That fort contains women and children. It's a large fort, but you, you, you can't do that. The admiral said, Mr. Key, don't worry about it. We've left them a way out. Francis Scott Key said, what is that? The admiral said, you see that flag over there, way up on the rampart? We've told them that if they'll lower that flag, we will stop the shelling immediately. By lowering that flag, we'll know that they've surrendered and we'll know that the war is over and you'll know that you're under British rule and we'll release all of the prisoners. One account says that at this point in time, Francis Scott Key was permitted again to go into the hold of the prison ship and tell the men what was about to happen. They asked, how many ships are there? Key said, hundreds. He said, man, I'm going back up on top to watch, and I'll, I'll shout down to you what I see. As twilight began to fall, the British war fleet began to unleash with full fury. The sound was deafening. There were so many blasts and so many reliefs in the deafening sounds, one shot after another, it was impossible to hear. The, star, the sky, although dark, was suddenly lit with the red glare of rockets. From down below, Key could hear the prisoners asking, Tell us where the flag is. Is it still there? What have they done with the flag? One hour, two hours, three hours into the shelling, every time, a bomb would explode close to the flag. Key could see the flag illuminated in the red glare of the bomb. And time after time, Key would report to the men down below, It's still there. The admiral asked to speak to Key. He said to him, 
Your people are insane. They don't understand that this is an impossible situation. One report says that Francis Scott Key thought at that moment about something that George Washington had once said. The thing that sets the American Christian apart from all other people in the world is that he will die on his feet before he'll live on his knees. The Admiral said, We've now instructed all of our guns to focus directly on that flag. But there's something that we don't understand here. Our reconnaissance tells us that that flag has been hit directly, time after time. And yet, that flag is still flying. We don't understand that. Now we're going to bring every gun to bear on that point. Francis Scott Key reports that the next three hours were unbearable. All that Key could hear was the bombs bursting in air, the deafening sound of gunfire, and the men in the prison ships praying that the flag would still be there. Records of those events reveal that between one 1,500 and over 2,000 200 pound bombs along with 800 rockets and literally tons of bullets were fired at Fort McHenry that night. Sunrise came and a heavy mist was hanging over the land but the rampart was tall enough and there stood the flag completely nondescript in shreds. The flagpole itself was at an odd angle, but the flag was still atop. That morning, September 14, 1814, the British warships withdrew. Francis Scott Key went ashore immediately. He went to Fort McHenry to see what had happened. He found the flag and the flagpole there that had suffered numerous direct hits. And when that flag had fallen, men, fathers, sons, brothers, who knew what it meant for that flag to touch the ground, although they knew that every gun in the British Navy was fixed on that position, would run over to that position and hold that flagpole in position until they died, and then their bodies would re be removed and another would take its place. Francis Scott Key said that what held that flagpole in place at such an angle was the dead bodies of the patriots. While he watched that bombardment of Fort McHenry, he penned a poem that later was put to music. I want to quote to you from the original first stanza. Oh, say can ye see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed by the twilight's last gleaming, whose bright stars and broad stripes through the clouds of the fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare 